همفزایی و صلح تبدیل برجام حاصل بیش از دو سال مذاکرات فشرده است که نتیجه آن مورد حمایت شورای امنیت سازمان ملل متحد و جامعه جهانی قرار گرفته و به صورت بخشی از قطنامه 2231 شورای امنیت در آمده است برجام متعلق به یک یا دو کشور نیست برجام سند شورای امنیت و متعلق به کل جامعه بین المللی است برجام ایجاد یک تعامل نو در مناسبات جدید جهانی است تعاملی مبتنی بر مشارکت و سازندگی دو جانبه میان ما و جهان ما درهای تعامل و همکاری را گشوده ایم ما دهها قرارداد توسعه با دولتهای توسعه یافته شرق و غرب بسته ایم متاسفانه برخی خود را از این امکان تازه محروم کردند این ظرفیت کریدورهای ترانزیت نمی توان پذیرفت رژیم قاسب صهیونیستی که با سلاح هستیش منطقه و جهان را تهدید می کند و متحد به هیچ مقررات و نظارت بین المللی نیست ملتهای صلح طلب را نصیحت کند با دسترسی به بازار بزرگ مل... ادبیات جاهلانه زشت و کین توزانه و مشهون از اطلاعات غلط و اتهامات بیپایه از زبان رئیس جمهور آمریکا علیه ملت ایران دیروز در این مجمع محترم شنیده شد نه تنها این گونه سخنها در شعن سازمان ملل نبود بلکه در تقابل با خواسته امروز همه ملت ها از این اجلاس است یعنی اتحاد دولت ها برای مقابله با جنگ و تروریسم یک جانب گرایی ارعاب و جنگ را به سراحت می گویم که جمهوری اسلامی ایران اولین کشوری نخواهد بود که برجام را نقض کند ولی در مواجهه با نقض آن عکس عملی متناسب و قاطع نشان خواهد داد اگر این توافق به دست نااهلان عرصه سیاست از بین برود مایه تأسف است و دنیا فرصت بزرگی را از دست داده است اما چنین اقدامی هرگز قادر نخواهد بود جمهوری اسلامی ایران را از مسیر پیشرفت و تعالی خود باز دارد دولت جدید آمریکا با پیمان شکنی و نقض تعهدات بین المللی فقط اعتبار جهانی خود را می شکند و اعتماد دولت ها و ملت ها نسبت به هر گونه مذاکره و تعهدی در آینده را از دست خواهد داد در زیر ساخت های حمل و نقل دریایی ریلی As President Trump said yesterday in his historic address to this General Assembly Just as each of you, in his words, should always put your country first, we will always put America first. But as his words, and I hope our presence here attests, America first does not mean America alone. As the President said, we will forever be a great friend of the world. His Excellency Prime Minister Lofben for his statement. Keeping the peace requires more than peacekeeping. It requires action. in the unwavering resolve of every country gathered here today. For as President Trump observed yesterday, we are once again confronted, in his words, by those who threaten us with chaos, with turmoil and terror. 
who seek to undermine the sovereignty, prosperity, and security, all of which the president called the pillars of peace. In Eastern Europe, Russia continues to compromise the sovereignty of its neighbors as it seeks to redraw international borders by force. Radical Islamic terrorism continues to beset nations with barbarous attacks in Barcelona, Paris, London. In the Middle East, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism continues to flout the spirit of the Iran deal, destabilizing the region and brazenly threatening the security of sovereign nations. The United States of America will continue to bring the full range of American power to bear on the regime in Pyongyang. We will continue to marshal economic and diplomatic pressure, ours and from countries across the world to demand that North Korea abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. As the President said yesterday, the United States has great strength and patience, but all options are on the table. And if we are forced to defend ourselves and our allies, we will do so with military power that is effective and overwhelming. A clear majority of the Human Rights Council's members fail to meet even the most basic human rights standards. Cuba sits on the Human Rights Council, an oppressive regime that has repressed its people and jailed political opponents for more than half a century. Venezuela sits on the Human Rights Council, a dictatorship that undermines democracy at every turn, imprisons political opponents, and as we speak, is advancing policies that worsen deprivation and poverty that's costing the lives of innocent men, women, and children. This body must reform the Human Rights Council's membership and its operation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The Human Rights Council has become a forum for anti-Semitism and invective against Israel. The Council's Agenda Item 7 actually singles out Israel for discussion at every single meeting, something no other country must endure. As evidence, the Human Rights Council has passed more than 70 resolutions condemning Israel while largely ignoring the world's worst human rights abusers. It is, as President Trump said yesterday, a massive source of embarrassment. And we call on the Security Council and this entire body to immediately embrace reforms of the membership and practices of the Human Rights Council and end the Human Rights Council's blatant bias against our cherished ally, Israel. I thank His Excellency Vice President. Hi, Neil. And yes, the meeting is a discussion with the uh, Prime Minister from Israel about compliance of Iran with the uh, nuclear treaty that was uh, enacted during the Obama administration. Of course, the Trump administration has to comply that they are in compliance, the Iranians, in October. So the president will be meeting with Mr. Netanyahu. He's also going to be meeting later this afternoon with uh, Emmanuel Macron from France discussing the Middle East and Iran's destabilization of the Middle East, as well as remaining compliance with the nuclear accord. Now, the other issue that is key at the United Nations today is reform of the United Nations budget. The United States donating roughly $3 billion to the budget, the largest single contributor. And the president is meeting with his counterparts, 128 member nations, who are committed to reining in the spending. Here's what the president said earlier today. We encourage all member states to look at ways to take bold stands at the United Nations with an eye toward changing business as usual and not being beholden to ways of the past which were not working. Now, the president will address the United Nations tomorrow morning. He, of course, is expected to talk about North Korea. North Korea is front and center, and the continuing problems that the rogue state poses to stability in Asia. It's Nikki Haley, the U.N. ambassador uh, from the United States, who actually said that if North Korea keeps on with its reckless behavior, North Korea will be destroyed, and we know that none of us want that. None of us want war. So... This is a big issue. The president speaking to the United Nations tomorrow. Back to you. His words uh, and his potential deeds, President Trump is moving the United States 
closer to war with Iran and away from peace. It's a dangerous activity, and it really is, is un, it, there's no reason for it. There's no reason why the United States would want to pull out of the Iran deal. It's working. Uh, the U.S. military says it's working. U.S. intelligence says it's working. Uh, with a deal that's working that's preventing Iran from moving towards nuclear weapons, the United States should be honoring this deal. If the United States pulls out, what message does that send to other countries that the United States might want to deal mm -hmm. with? For example, North Korea. Here we are trying to reduce the threat in North Korea, trying to negotiate some kind of agreement. Why should the North work with Donald Trump if he's pulling out of agreements left and right? Could he be bluffing, though, because we know, for example, if the United States were to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal, other world powers would still be signed on to it. I mean, is the U.S. just isolating itself by doing something like that? It's a risk not worth taking. You know, why should Donald Trump take the risk of withdrawing from the Iran deal? Yes, it's true. Iran may stay in the deal, but they may not. It could very well pave the way for Iran coming out of the deal, for the deal falling apart and for the, the great risk of military action by the United States going up. So, I mean, that is the danger. There's no reason to go there, and we can only hope that President Trump will not take such a dangerous action. You mentioned uh, North Korea and the fact if Trump withdraws from this negotiated agreement with Iran, it would send a message to Pyongyang. The U.S. isn't a very trustworthy negotiating partner. Do they have reason to believe the United States as it is now? I mean, th in the 90s, we negotiated nuclear deals with Korea and didn't really mm -hmm. necessarily pull out or uh, uphold our end. So, mm -hmm. North Korea has many reasons already to distrust President Trump, for sure. But let's not give them any more. I mean, negotiations is really the only solution to the North Korean crisis. There's no good military options. Sanctions are not working. Uh, negotiations are our best bet going forward. So let's not make that any more likely by giving North Korea yet another reason to distrust President Trump. How uh, do you think uh, President Trump uh, should handle uh, North Korea? You say there's only a, a diplomatic solution. Would that include acknowledging the North Koreans might just have a nuclear program? I mean, well, facts are facts. You know, we North, know North Korea has a nuclear program. North Korea has nuclear weapons. So let's not get let that get in the way of solving this problem. Uh, we need negotiations with the North. First of all, to establish the interests of both sides. We don't want to stumble into war. And that's the greatest danger right now, is that one side will do something that is misperceived by the other, and we will stumble into a crisis that could lead to nuclear war. So we need to be talking to the North, the United States, uh, North Korea directly, one on one, to figure out where the red lines are and to make sure that we don't stumble into something. And then building on that, we need to try to figure out is the way to freeze North Korea's nuclear and missile program in exchange for something the North wants, for example, freezing U.S. military uh, exercises mm -hmm. with the South. There's, there's grounds there to talk, and we need to start that process as soon as possible. It doesn't seem, though, that Washington is open to that. I mean, you have Kim on the record saying they would freeze their program if Washington and Seoul freeze these, uh, these drills, but right. it's all quiet. It seems the ball's in our court. Right. I mean, the Trump administration seems to be courting war both with North Korea and with Iran at the same time. It makes no sense. Uh, there's no reason for it. It's dangerous. And they need to hear that they need to shift gears. It's very dangerous, as you say, because these are two countries where you can't just march in and start taking down statues and dismantling the government, as you know we didn't, or the United States didn't in Iraq, for example. Do you think the United States is actually limited in, in what it can do here? And that's part of the frustration we're hearing from Trump. The United States can't get what it wants out of Iran and North Korea. I think President Trump does not like his options. He keeps asking for military options on North Korea, for example, and his aides tell him, sir, there are no good military options. You have to talk to them. He doesn't like that, but, you know, the reality is the reality. He would like Iran to be cheating on the nuclear deal. They are not, but he has to deal with reality. So President Trump has to deal with the facts on the ground. And he has to do things that will improve U.S. security rather than risking war. All right. Tom Kalina, Director of Policy at Plowshares Fund, thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Good evening, Brett. A new threat tonight from our Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. He tweeted that if the U.S. withdraws from the nuclear agreement, Iran may resume its uranium enrichment. But he says as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, that's no option. It's all part of the delicate diplomatic dance and the increasing standoff between the U.S. and Iran here at the U.N.
Today was Iranian President Hassan Rouhani's chance to return President Trump's volley that Iran was a murderous, repressive regime. The ignorant, absurd, and hateful rhetoric filled with ridiculously baseless allegations that was uttered before this august body yesterday was not only unfit to be heard at the United Nations, but indeed contradicted the demands of our nations from this world body to bring governments together. He insisted his nation is abiding by the Iranian nuclear agreement and again denied his country wants a nuclear bomb. He said since the pact has the support of the international community, it should not be abandoned by one nation, the U.S. And he said that with another dig at the White House. It will be a great pity if this agreement were to be destroyed by rogue newcomers to the world of politics. But the Trump administration is gunning for the agreement's sunset clause that ends restrictions on Iran's nuclear program in about a decade. Critics say that will pave the way for Tehran to develop nuclear weapons. In his interview with Brett Baer last night, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson warned of that very prospect. The agreement comes to an end, and so we can almost start the countdown clock as to when they will resume their nuclear weapons capability. The president could decertify the deal next month, and when he met with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, he teased that he has already made up his mind. Well, I have to say it. As Rouhani spoke inside the UN, Iranian opposition groups held a massive demonstration against him across the street. They denounced both his appearance here and the nuclear deal. Nothing about the atrocious, aggressive, extremist behavior of Iran has changed. President Trump sees that. Well, other voices are calling for opening up the agreement. French President uh, Emmanuel Macron says it should include ballistic missiles. It now does not. And in one hour from now, the P5 plus Germany will be meeting with Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. As you know, Zarif negotiated the agreement with Obama Secretary of State John Kerry. But in 60 minutes from now, Zarif will be sitting across the table from Rex Tillerson, a different Secretary of State, who tonight will bring Zarif a different message. ارت بین المللی نیست ملت های صلح طلب را نصیحت کند ارزان با دسترسی به بازار بزرگ ادبیات جاهلانه زشت و کین توزانه و مشهون از اطلاعات غلط و اتهامات بی پایه از زبان رئیس جمهور آمریکا علیه ملت ایران دیروز در این مجمع محترم شنیده شد نه تنها این گونه سخنها در شأن سازمان ملل نبود بلکه در تقابل با خواسته امروز همه ملتها از این اجلاس است یعنی اتحاد دولتها برای مقابله با جنگ و تروریزم یک جانب گرایی ارعاب و جنگ را به سراحت می گویم که جمهوری اسلامی ایران اولین کشوری نخواهد بود که برجام را نقض کند ولی در مواجهه با نقض آن عکس عملی متناسب و قاطع نشان خواهد داد اگر این توافق به دست نااهلان عرصه سیاست از بین برود مایه تأصف است و دنیا فرصت بزرگی را از دست داده است اما چنین اقدامی هرگز قادر نخواهد بود جمهوری اسلامی ایران را از مسیر پیشرفت و تعالی خود باز دارد دولت جدید آمریکا با پیمان شکنی و نقض تعهدات بین المللی فقط اعتبار جهانی خود را می شکند و اعتماد دولت ها و ملت ها نسبت به هر گونه مذاکره و تعهدی در آینده را از دست 
خواهد داد Mr. President, uh, Chairperson Faki, as President Trump said yesterday in his historic address to this General Assembly, just as each of you, in his words, should always put your country first, we will always put America first. But as his words and I hope our presence here attests, America first does not mean America alone. As the President said, we will forever be a great friend of the world. His Excellency Prime Minister Lofben for his statement. Keeping the peace requires most members fail to meet even the most basic human rights standards. Cuba sits on the Human Rights Council, an oppressive regime that has repressed its people and jailed political opponents for more than half a century. Venezuela sits on the Human Rights Council, a dictatorship that undermines democracy at every turn, imprisons political opponents, and as we speak, is advancing policies that worsen deprivation and poverty that's costing the lives of innocent men, women, and children. This body must reform the Human Rights Council's membership and its operation. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The Human Rights Council has become a forum for anti-Semitism and invective against Israel. The Council's agenda, item seven, actually singles out Israel for discussion at every single meeting, something no other country must endure. As evidence, the Human Rights Council has passed more than 70 resolutions condemning Israel while largely ignoring the world's worst human rights abusers. It is, as President Trump said yesterday, a massive source of embarrassment. And we call on the Security Council and this entire body to immediately embrace reforms of the membership and practices of the Human Rights Council and end the Human Rights Council's blatant bias against our cherished ally, Israel. I thank His Excellency Vice President. Hi, Neil. And yes, the meeting is a discussion with the uh, Prime Minister from Israel about compliance of Iran with the uh, nuclear treaty that was uh, enacted during the Obama administration. Of course, the Trump administration has to comply that they are in compliance, the Iranians, in October. So the president will be meeting with Mr. Netanyahu. He's also going to be meeting later this afternoon with uh, Emmanuel Macron from France discussing the Middle East and Iran's destabilization of the Middle East, as well as remaining compliance with the nuclear accord. Now, the other issue that is key at the United Nations today is reform of the United Nations budget. The United States donating roughly $3 billion to the budget, the largest single contributor. And the president is meeting with his counterparts, 128 member nations, who are committed to reining in the spending. Here's what the president said earlier today. We encourage all member states to look at ways to take bold stands at the United Nations with an eye toward changing business as usual and not being beholden to ways of the past which were not working. Now, the President will address the United Nations tomorrow morning. He, of course, is expecting... برجام سند شورای امنیت و متعلق به کل جامعه بین المللی است برجام ایجاد یک تعامل نو در مناسبات جدید جهانی است تعاملی مبتنی بر مشارکت و سازندگی دو جانبه میان ما و جهان ما درهای تعامل و همکاری را گشوده ایم ما دهها قرارداد توسعه با دولت‌های توسعه یافته شرق و غرب بسته ایم متاسفانه برخی خود را از این امکان تازه محروم کردند این ظرفیت کریدورهای ترانزیت نمیتوان پذیرفت رژیم قاسب صهیونیستی که با سلاح هسته‌ایش منطقه و جهان را تهدید می کند و متعهد به هیچ مقررات و نظارت بین المللی نیست 
ملتهای صلح طلب را نصیحت کند دید ارزان با دسترسی به بازار بزرگ مل... ادبیات جاهلانه زشت و کین توزانه و مشهون از اطلاعات غلط و اتهامات بیپایه از زبان رئیس جمهور آمریکا علیه ملت ایران دیروز در این مجمع محترم شنیده شد نه تنها این گونه سخنها در شعن سازمان ملل نبود بلکه در تقابل با خواسته امروز همه ملتها از این اجلاس است یعنی اتحاد دولتها برای مقابله با جنگ و تروریسم یک جانب گرایی ارعاب و جنگ را به سراحت میگویم که جمهوری اسلامی ایران اولین کشوری نخواهد بود که برجام را نقض کند ولی در مواجهه با نقض آن عکس عملی متناسب و قاطع نشان خواهد داد اگر این توافق به دست نااهلان عرصه سیاست از بین برود مایه تأسف است و دنیا فرصت بزرگی را از دست داده است اما چنین اقدامی هرگز قادر نخواهد بود جمهوری اسلامی ایران را از مسیر پیشرفت و As president said yesterday the United States has great strength and patience but all options are on the table and if we are forced to defend ourselves and our allies we will do so with military power that is effective and overwhelming del complexité qu'il est illusoire this 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 spirit a clear majority of the human rights council's members fail to meet even the most basic human rights standards cuba sits on the human rights council an oppressive regime that has repressed its people and jailed political opponents for more than half a century. Venezuela sits on the Human Rights Council, a dictatorship that undermines democracy at every turn, imprisons political opponents, and as we speak, is advancing policies that worsen deprivation and poverty that's costing the lives of innocent men, women, and children. This body must reform the Human Rights Council's membership and its operation. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The Human Rights Council has become a forum for anti-Semitism and invective against Israel. The Council's agenda item seven actually singles out Israel for discussion at every single meeting, something no other country must endure. As evidence, the Human Rights Council has passed more than 70 resolutions condemning Israel while largely ignoring the world's worst human rights abusers. It is, as President Trump said yesterday, a massive source of embarrassment. And we call on the Security Council and this entire body to immediately embrace reforms of the membership and practices of the Human Rights Council and end the Human Rights Council's blatant bias against our cherished ally, Israel. I thank His Excellency Vice President. Hi, Neil. And yes, the meeting is a discussion with the uh, Prime Minister from Israel about compliance of Iran with the uh, nuclear treaty that was uh, enacted during the Obama administration. Of course, the Trump administration has to comply that they are in compliance, the Iranians, in October. So the president will be meeting with Mr. Netanyahu. He's also going to be meeting later this afternoon with uh, Emmanuel Macron from France discussing the Middle East and Iran's destabilization of the Middle East as well as Iranian compliance with the nuclear accord. Now, the other issue that is key at the United Nations today is reform of the United Nations budget. The United States donating roughly $3 billion to the budget, the largest single contributor. And the president is meeting with his counterparts, 128 member nations who are committed to reining in the spending. Here's what the president said earlier.